And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. The Pope on Film After Dark. <laughs> Welcome to my boudoir where you can see all of my sexy accoutrements, such as my spirit Halloween pillow and the glasses and cell phone holder my wife crocheted. Ah, this is where the magic happens. So, it's time, Bunny! It's time! It's time! Yes, Bunny, my friend who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee, because it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film to gritty our way into the second half of our big show. And it is second half where it is said second half wherein we finally in eventually get around to discussing our all new director's cut digitally remastered. And now with 20 minutes of never before seen footage movie of the week. And this week, we continue our summer of Roger Corman with a very cheap double feature of B-movies, Little Shop of Horrors from 1960, and The Pit and the Pendulum from 1961. Dramatic music. Dun, dun, dun. This week. Our third week into our very cheap Roger Corman summer. Yes. We make it out of the 50s and head into the colorful swinging 60s with our double feature. And this is a good one. These are two that were, um, as opposed to most Roger Corman films, these two were actually successful. So the first film that we will be talking about is Little Shop of Horrors. And um, the only... It, it, this film is Thor and a bucket of blood is Loki. Yes. Most people know Thor. Oh man, Thor. And he's all handsome and, and this and that. But also he's kind of one dimensional. Now, there's a lot of depth in Loki. And yeah. Loki's sort of like a fan favorite. And there's a lot going on there, but people know Thor more. Yes. Little Shop of Horrors is Thor. A Bucket of Blood is Loki. So Roger Corman did A Bucket of Blood. He finished it early, and they were like, okay, here, if you want something in here, there you go. Okay. And so Roger, or, and so the, the studio was all like, okay. We're destroying these sets in two days. And, yeah. and Roger Corman's like, two days? I can make a movie in two days. And so he quickly threw together a movie, and in the two days before the sets were tore down, he made another film. And that is this film, Little Shop of Horrors. But now, how much, it when it comes to Roger Corman, like, how much of these stories are we actually to be are we to believe excuse me excuse me but seymour's house is obviously walter paisley's room that he rents from mrs swicket no no okay so no fine yeah but and then they at had the, the end script going he didn't put a whole fucking movie together in two days that script is uh, genius for little shop of horrors he did not yeah. crank this out in an hour on the toilet. No, no, no. That's that's the thing. Like, the rumor is like, oh, he filmed this movie in two days. No. In the two days that the sets were still available, he filmed all of the interior shots. That I can accept. Yeah. So, that makes a lot which more is sense. Still, which is still impressive. Very impressive. You know, let's not get it wrong, but but that's Roger Corman. You you always have to try to separate the bullshit from the reality. Yes, but you can clearly see, like they've made the living room area 
of Walter Paisley's room that he rents. Yeah. To look different. But then there's one scene where he goes into the kitchen. It is 100% the kitchen where Bert Convy was dripping into a saucepan. <laughs> 100%. And also, uh, uh, at the end, when they're chasing Seymour in the same way that they chased Walter Paisley after they figured out about his sculptures. Uh, So they're running to catch Seymour, and Seymour ends up in a warehouse, and it's the exact exact same warehouse that uh, fucking Walter Paisley used that thing to cut off the guy. Internet connection is unstable. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm unstable. Yes. We already knew that? Ouch. Yeah, that is why I take meds. Am I good now? You're good now. Okay, good. The so, warehouse. You, you're kind of in the warehouse. Oh yeah, the warehouse is the warehouse at the end that Seymour runs into is the same warehouse where Walter Paisley cut off that guy's head with the saw. Yeah. And speaking of Walter Paisley, it's time once again for Dick Watch 2024. Yes. Our man, the king of the character actors, Mr. Dick Miller appears three minutes into this film as the guy who eats flowers. And I want to stop and talk about this. Originally, Dick Miller was going to play Seymour, but he dropped out. And I kind of understand it, because at the time, he was in his like late 20s, and he yeah. didn't want to be typecast as like this wimpy, bookworm, nerdish guy, because basically Seymour is just the exact same person as Walter Paisley and he didn't yeah. want to be typecast and I understand that he got a part where he does kind of look dashing and he's in it a lot and you know he comes in in his nice suits and he's eating flowers it's it's yeah. a memorable part oh but he is not just eating flowers man he is fucking selling it you know they're, they're yeah, having he is. conversations all around he's just standing oh. there eating the flowers yeah, it's his idea to uh, if he if Dick Miller wasn't in this movie, Seymour would have been fired. End of film. Nobody would have died. Yeah. So if anything, Dick Miller starts this whole thing, this whole movie going. So, so he plays a cool, good looking plant eater that gets the whole ball rolling. But there is an alternate universe out there where Dick Miller did star in A Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors back-to-back. And in my mind, that kick-started the Dick Miller cinematic universe. Oh. Kind of like how Kelton the Cop was in three Ed Wood movies. Yes. I can imagine Roger Corman making A Bucket of Blood and then making Little Shop of Horrors and having both of them a success and then saying, like Roger Corman would, people like Dick Miller as a murderous weirdo that's all I'm making now. Yeah. And I could see him making like four, five, six, seven other Walter Paisley type movies starring Dick Miller. Yeah. Absolutely. So, like, I I think I can see that and I can see Little Shop of Horrors being better because Dick Miller is starring in it. Yes. 100%. Odd fact. This was turned into a musical, obviously. And they made a movie in the 80s starring Canadian treasure Rick Moran. Yes. That movie was the first time that Bill Murray and Steve Martin were in a movie together. Really? Okay. That feels wrong in my head. But yeah, that was the first time they were ever in a movie together. Huh, yeah. Blows my mind. It is weird. It see, is weird. I, I see it more like between this and the movie are just two different things. 
Yes. And I feel they're both very good in their own right. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I kind of have a soft a soft spot for the musical again from growing up in New York and seeing commercials for the off-Broadway play. Yeah. You know, so like little shop that that's like ingrained into me. Yeah. But I the only song from the Little Shop of Horrors musical that I like is fucking Steve Martin's dentist song. Yeah. That is fucking golden. I love it. That's one of my favorite musical numbers. Yeah. Of all time is Steve Martin being You'll be a dentist. Love that. But they had a cut a out fan of the musical. a lot of gold from the they original movie. They cut out a lot. To, to make room for the music. Yeah, here's a couple of the things that they cut out. The Dragnet impersonators. The what? The Dragnet impersonators. Yes. Like, they're narrating this original film. They are nowhere in it. Um, and number two, here's another thing that's missing from the musical. The intense racism. Yes. Because number one, Mr. Mr. Mushnik's accent is essentially Dr. Zoidberg from Futurama. Okay. Doctor, Mr. Mushnik is just a Jewish crustacean from space. Period. Okay. And then the old Jewish woman who always has family members die, and I looked this up. Her name, her character's name is yes. City Shiva. I oh, I love that. And that's racist as fuck. Why is that racist? Why? Why it, are? Why it, are you calling Jewish comedy racist? And so her name is City Shiva, and she goes they, to funerals all the like time. It. Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it. I. Yeah, one thing that I love about the musical is that you see the plant in the movie and it's, you know, black and white and it's small yeah. and then it opens it in its mouth and then it says, Rainbow! and it's like, that voice sucks. Yeah. When I think of Little Shop of Horrors, I think of the black and white movie. I still hear Audrey as an awesome black person. Yes. That is the voice of Audrey. Yeah. Two. In this, it's Audrey Jr. But this movie is a classic, a cheap ass classic, an odd, strangely written classic with with an ending. The ending of this movie reminds me of the the movie yesterday in that Roger Corman has written himself into a wall. Yeah. He has no way how to get out of it. And here is the way that they've, that they've decided to end this film. And it's not perfect. It, yeah. Did I lock up again? Uh, kind of, sort of. Okay. You can, you can hear me though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, I don't know which version you saw, because there's a billion versions out there, but I found a colorized version on YouTube, and I watched that. It is the worst fucking colorization I have ever seen. Yeah. It is fucking horrible. I liked it because it was in high definition, and a lot of times with these old movies, it can be difficult to find like a high-definition version of the film. So I liked how highly defined it was, but if someone, someone's in color, they touch their hand, and the place where their hand is, like the background is now black and white. Oh. Okay. It's really weird. Yeah. It is 
it is fascinating to look at, if for no other reason, to see how weird and bad their uh, colorization is. But that's it for Little Shop of Horrors. We all know the the story of that. I do like the original ending to the musical. They spent $1 million on the ending to Little Shop of Horrors, but because the ending is everyone gets eaten, the plant becomes a success, they take over America, and now everyone's dying. Watch out for the plant. Credits. Uh, audiences fucking hated it, so they created a happy ending to the musical at the last second. Yeah. But you can still go on YouTube and watch the end, the original ending, which is amazing to watch because, yeah, they spent a million dollars on this one musical number, and then they had to cut it. Wow. Yeah. But a, there, when you go and see the play, a lot of times people are shocked because, like, oh, no, the plant's about to eat Seymour. Seymour's going to free himself. Seymour's going to save the day. Seymour's fucking dead? <laughs> Damn! And the end of the play is the song Beware of the Plants. And this entire movie has just been like a public service announcement warning you about the fact that these plants are now taking over America and killing everyone and watch out for the plants. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally different. So, that's Little Shop of Horrors. Our second film! Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yes. Vincent Boom Boom Price. Vinny Price. Everybody's got a Vincent Price for the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Yeah. Vinny Price in an Eddie Allen Poe horror costume drama. Just inject this shit directly into my veins. Yeah. Fucking love it. This was the second of eight Edgar Allan Poe adaptations that Corman cranked out between 1960 and 1964. I want to be clear about that. Eight Edgar Allan Poe adaptations in five years. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah, and, and of course, each one was even more unfaithful to the source material as the last one. Yeah. But all of these uh, Edgar Allan Poe movies were critical and commercial hits, which is odd to hear the words Roger Corman and hit film in the same sentence. Yeah, oh, don't blame me there. Yeah. But, but here we are. And I find that fascinating. This movie was so cheap. How cheap was it? Thank you. That they didn't have the money in the budget to build any sets. So they rented and borrowed sets from other major studios. And as far as I can tell, they didn't do this. But in my heart of hearts, Roger Corman stole some of this shit from other studios. <laughs> a la Ed Wood. Well, Chris, no, this one, make though, it. the legend had always had it is that Roger Corman had bought a castle. That is so not that he could make case. all of these fucking castle movies what so he can make all of these movies in a spooky castle and get it to pay for itself yeah huh. so yeah uh i can totally see roger corman stealing candelabras and tapestries from universal studio yeah like uh just like in ed wood fun fact the doctor in this dr leon dr leon that's played by anthony carbone he owned the yellow door in oh. a bucket of blood. Oh, 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 okay. He was the owner guy who, as far as I'm concerned, in a bucket of blood. 
is just as complicit in Walter Paisley's murders. Yes. As Walter Paisley was. So I like the fact that he's in this. I love about the blood. So originally, uh, Dick Miller was going to star in this film as the pendulum. <laughs> but he did not want to be typecast as medieval torture devices, which I understand. I get that. But I think it would have been much better. Of, with, uh, with, with Dick Miller's slight Brooklyn accent, fuck yeah. Yeah, as the pendulum. There is a lot of uh, discussions that I'm skipping. We could talk about uh, how the fact that the music composer is a big time musician that invented the genre of exotica music. Really? Okay. Basically, he invented tiki music all by himself. It, it, the guy who did the music for this is a big ass deal. And then the screenwriter was Richard Matheson. Yeah, that I is saw that. that is huge, and then of course Barbara Steele. Holy shit! Yeah. She was the queen of British scream queens. Yeah, except I don't think she, I, I, I she doesn't really quite fit scream queen. Where I think she plays better with the boys. You know, I, I really have her on an equal level with. Vincent Price or Boris Karloff or and I agree with that but uh that's what they called her on with oh I'm sure they did yeah uh but yeah she's amazing Luna Luna you are not you're not getting a spin-off we're wrapping up this podcast it's not gonna be the Luna show Jeannie and Luna's break time hijinks over here. <laughs> she's trying to get she's trying to get a spin-off. It's like it's Q all over again. Oh, okay, yeah, that's that's what did it. So fun fact, Bunny. Yeah. Uh the main reason, and this was discovered later, the main reason why Dick Miller dropped out of being the pendulum in 1961's The Pit and the Pendulum is because after Little Shop of Horrors, Dick Miller developed a severe plant-eating addiction. Oh. That'll happen. You know, and that that ruins lives. Yeah. You know, you get addicted to eating plants, and next thing you know, you're sucking dick for a marigold money. And it's it all starts with the dandelions out in the yard. Mm hmm I wonder if we so are you now know, the... so so fuck the bees. It's the bees or our children. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, bees? I don't like jazz. You wanna what grow now? you wanna oh. grow dandelions for your precious little pollinators? You can suck on my pollinators. And our children are just going to start eating them. They're going to start eating think... dandelions. Then they're going to move <clears throat> up to carnations. You know, the, the, and next the kids thing you know, who all drink it into heavy like metal music will eat the roses. Yep. It's, it's, it's sad. It's sad. Bunny, do you... There's. I think now there is a good chance that we have made history as the first podcast to say the sentence, to say the phrase, sucking dick for dandelion. Yes. Pretty sure that uh, my brother, my brother and me, and welcome to Night Vale, have never said this phrase before. No. So we're kind of historical. Bunny! Do you we want still hold to the record for saying church organist? Yes, we do. Like we even said that more than the short-lived podcast church organists. Yes. Weekly. Yes. 
last week tonight with church organists. Bunny, do you want to hit us with the plot of the pit and the pendulum? It's a difficult okay, one. Okay, so uh, this is, oh God, what is even the time period? Kind of a medieval, possibly Renaissance-ish, going Ish. by the roughs uh, yeah. period. And we watch a guy ride in a carriage for a long time while we roll credits. And he comes to Vincent Price's castle. Vincent yeah. Price, this guy turns out to be Vincent Price's wife's brother who has come because his sister has died. Yeah. Vincent Price's wife. Uh, man, I had really a hard time with the stories they were telling this guy. And and there, there were numerous flashbacks. You know, I take a couple of issues with some of the plot points going on here. But <laughs> anyway, he is trying to make sure that his sister really did die. What? Honorably or no foul play or something like that? or No idea. No idea. So, but then, but then, and and that's and that's basically it. You know, we it's just kind of mystery around around the wife's death and you know the husband's past and all that. But the stories they were given were just incredible. So apparently, from what he said, the first version was. Well, you know, she just went mad, wandered into my torture room, and then the boy wandered into my torture room and got herself closed in the Iron Maiden. You know, like happens, you know. All the time. And the brother seemed a bit suspicious of this, but not nearly fucking as suspicious as I, I, I think Warren did. Yeah. No, she just wandered into an Iron Maiden and shut herself in. Sure. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the thing that gets me. I feel like Vincent Price isn't the bad guy here. Yeah. And, like, at the end, they're fighting him. And like they kill him, but like he was just having a mental episode. Yes. His dead wife came back to life and he lost his mind and thought he was his dad, his violent dad. Yes. That doesn't mean you have to kill him. He didn't do any of this. But but see, that's what gives me the problem to begin with. Like like so you're the brother, like isn't your first fucking question like, why do you have a torture room? Yeah. You know, maybe this is the first question. Yeah. You know, and how did she just kind of get herself closed in the Iron Maiden? Was she like a cat getting stuck in the refrigerator? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, basically. Well, to be fair, but then we've all the done doctor it. shows up and adds on, "Well, she saw something that was just so frightening that she closed herself in an Iron Maiden." I mean, I've I've wanted to. I that's what I wanted to do after watching Rock of Ages. Yeah. I wanted to lock myself up after watching well, that you... film. You, you, you. Time will still tell on that movie, my friend. Yeah. Uh, that's. We still Bunny's, watch it every Christmas. Bunny's dogma uh Rock of Ages. Just like in Dogma, where. Oh, just like when you said, what would be the better, what would be the more successful film, E.T. or Crush Groove? Hey, 
Time will tell on that one. <laughs> That's what Bunny's doing. He's crush grooving it. Okay, so here's the thing about this film, The Pit and the Pendulum. Um, it's a costume period horror film. It looks pretty beautiful. It's very colorful. It's got like a crazy color palette, despite being cheap as fuck. Um, I think I like this film. Oh, I like this film. I like this film a lot, but I, I find that it's just that is just such a big gaping plot hole. Yeah, like exactly what happened that it's just forgotten about, really. But I feel that when it comes to all of Roger Corman's Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, he got the story, he got a setting, and then he just went off on his own. So when I see this movie and I get confused about the plot, I feel like that's not Edgar Allan Poe's fault. That's fucking doing is making a movie that his budget allows. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, Funny. you're coming back. Funny. I can hear can you. You're you kind of lagging. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So that's all I've got for this week. Um. But then, okay. But then, but then the whole thing is to mind fuck Vincent Price for reasons I am not clear. So like that why they the wanted cast. to do that. So, so the wife faked her death with the help of the doctor who owned the yellow door in the hopes that they could drive him mad and she would be the person who inherits their massive castle. Yeah. Okay. And I'm assuming fortune. Okay. But even still, like, exactly what did you expect to happen here? You wanted to drive him insane. You drove him insane. You had all the clues to know what direction I of insane it, I he would probably go. When I see plot holes, bizarre plot choices like this uh, in this summer, the answer that I come up with in my head is just Chinatown. Like, oh, but there's this plot hole, and why did this character do this? And I'm so confused. Why is this happening? Uh, lay off the shade. <laughs> it's a Corman. <laughs> Yeah, forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. It's yeah. by any means necessary. It seems you're lagging out bad now. Seems as if Roger Corman would be one of those people. Uh... So you might want to wrap it up. You know I'd go from rags to like, um, riches. George Weiss and Ed Wood. Man, freaking funny. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, Jesus. Okay, so let's wrap this up. That's all I've got for this week and the Pope on Film podcast. Next week, it might be a bit difficult. I apologize. It's a Roger Corman summer. They can't all be winners. Uh oh. Okay, so next week we will be watching these, two films from these 1960. Are the first two winners. What do you mean all? <laughs> Look, next week we're watching two films from 1963. We'll be watching The Intruder, starring William Shatner. Yeah, and I'm sorry, buddy, but I have to do it. Fucking dementia 13. Oh, God, no. 
got to. We've got oh. to. We've I mean, got the, to do it. The intruder's not bad. The intruder at least has a good heart to it. I've never seen and, that. And, and, and no, William I, Shatner. Willie Shat, I believe, yeah. is how he likes to be called. The Willie Shat. So, yeah, The Intruder and Dementia 13. But I promise you, the rest of the, the rest of the summer is going to be pretty great. This will okay. be like the hardest one. God, I think I've only seen Dementia 13 once. It sucked that bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But it, Coppola, we've got to watch it. We've got to watch it. Yeah. We've, we've got to. So uh, that's next week. And it's, it's, it's going to hurt. But now that I look back at this week, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, the Scrooge McDuck tax. The Scrooge McDuck tax. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Charles Manson almost did an Elmer McCurdy. Yeah. Uh, divorce lawyers. Uh, Barbara Steele. Dick Miller. Dr. Zoidberg. I've got to say, I think this has been a good episode of the podcast. This has been a damn good episode of the podcast. Okay, good. I, I felt the same way, but I didn't want to say that because I feel like you're the one who makes that distinction. But yes, I concur with your assessment. Good, sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend May Lynn. And on behalf of Natasha and Q and Eleanor and Max and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you, and you rich. And you riches? And you poo poo? Oh man, here, here, uh, play me out. Do 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 do